Please welcome Dr. Nathan Upham. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, how do you guys feel in the back without a microphone? Is it it's okay? Yeah, okay, I think we'll, because, and then the, this microphone's still working for the video? Okay. Great, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, um, and thanks for, for putting up with my, my long title. I think uh, I, I kind of wanted th that title to be more informative and to get people here, but really I think we could simplify it that a lot of what I'll be talking about will just be about the evolution of mammals, and, and probably you could even simplify it to just talking about evolution sort of generally with mammals as an example. Because mammals are, end up being kind of an awesome example um, for a number of reasons that I'll, that I'll get into. So, so let me just, just start out really, really basic and thinking about, you know, what, what is a mammal, right? We, we kind of throw this term around. Um, you know, just a, just a show of hands, like, or, or if anyone wants to say, like, are, are all three of these mammals? So we have, we've got a polar bear, a pangolin, and a platypus. Which one of these is not a mammal? Platypus? Anyone else? Some some murmurs. What about what about is this one a mammal? This this one I just changed. So that so this that's the pangolin. It has it has nipples. Does that does that matter for being a mammal? So so as it turns out, that does matter, right? So um, all all three of those are mammals. So it's a trick question. Um, and, and to have mammae is uh, one of the main characters of being a, being a mammal, right? So even though the duckbill platypus uh, lays eggs, it's a, it's a mammal because they have these milk patches that they excrete milk. Um, and they don't even have nipples, actually. So, so that just, just um, giving, giving live birth would be one trait. Um, having these, these milk patches or mammae some of which are attached to, to nipples is another trait. And then along, along with these um, other kind of key traits that define the group of mammals, so lactation, hair, fur, these three middle ear bones, there's a big transition that happens from reptiles to acquire those middle ear bones. And then uh, the neocortex, which obviously uh, has different sizes throughout, throughout mammals. But sort of the, the, you know, the interesting thing, we, when you unite this group based on these traits, and you end up seeing, you know, now we're up to uh, over uh, 6,400 species that are described and valid in, in mammals. Um, you know, from things like whales through rodents, obviously primates, shrews, um, and then things like duckbill platypus and marsupials. It's sort of, you know, how do we organize that information? So we see all this, we see all this diversity, and we know that it arose in some fashion. There's, there is some process. And, and uh, we'll be talking about that process a lot today. So the, we organize this biodiversity into 27 orders, which are these kind of major lineages that are represented on the outside of this, this um, tree or phylogeny. And so I'll kind of walk through them, right? So we talked about the duckbill platypus, right? It's, um, it's a monotreme. There's, there's five uh, s total sp living species of monotremes that are along this, oops, that's not the right one. They're along this long branch here. Um, and, it, and you see that's sort of separate from the, from the rest of mammals, according to this, this graph diagram. Um, oh, and actually you can see, this is uh, a picture of these duckbill platypus young lapping the milk up out of its fur. Pretty awesome. Uh, so then marsupials, right? So we, we're familiar with the kangaroo, obviously. Um, you know, pictures of, of a joey inside the pouch here. But marsupials have this sort of unique trait where they give birth to, to young that's very immature. So you, these are all uh, tiny little offspring that come out into, the, into the, um, the world very underdeveloped and need to stay with the mom in their pouch. Uh, here's, a, here's a possum here. And then uh, thinking about placentals. So most of what we think about when we, when we talk about mammals is placentals. You know, it's about 6,000 species. Um, you know, everything from primates to whales to rodents to bats. And so the, the really interesting aspect of this, you know, th that, that diagram that was connecting these different uh, lineages of animals can be sort of simplified into, into something that we call a phylogeny, also called a tree of life, or a time tree, when they're scaled to time, as this one is here. And so we have you know, the monotremes, the marsupials, the placentals. 
And where, where these uh, branches meet uh, is representative of the common ancestor. And so in, in this case, um, you know, the marsupials and placentals are more closely related to each other than the monotremes. That's, that's, what the, that's what information is being conveyed by this graph. And so ultimately what this ends up being is, is sort of a map of the, uh, the ancestor to descendant connections or these like kind of evolutionary relationships. And, uh, and it's scaled to time, right? So we, for an, uh, a number of different lines of evidence that I'll talk more about, uh, you know, have this information, and this was about 180 million years ago that these last shared a common ancestor. This is about 160 million years ago. And, and we're really, we're reconstructing these things back from the present into the past. And we'll talk a lot about this kind of reconstructing process. How do we know this information? And really, how, how much do we actually know? And, and so this, you know, this comparison from you know, 27 orders to the full tree where you're, at, rather than just, just uh, mapping one representative of, of an order, you're putting all the species in the, in the same phylogeny, uh, ends up looking something like this. And so, so part of what, what you end up noticing when you, when you look at this uh, is that something like the rodents, which is just represented by one order, and bats, uh, one order, have tons of species diversity. And so we, we kind of know this intuitively. We know that there's a lot of different rodent species um, and that there's a, there's a lot of diversity of bats. Uh, we might not necessarily interact with them in our daily life because most of them are nocturnal. Um, and a lot of the things that we do see, like say when people go on safari or you see uh, images of safari in Africa, right? Like, a lot of the, that diversity is, is all active during the daytime. Um, and it's a lot of you know, these, these charismatic megafauna. So a lot of the smaller things is where a lot of the species diversity is. And so there's this, this major question you know, that I raised in the, in the title of the talk about you know, why are there so many rodents and, and why are there so many bats? And that, that question is kind of purposefully vague because it, it applies both to species diversity and to abundance, right? So there's also, we know there's a lot of um, certain types of rodents, such as in, in, uh, you know, the house mouse, that's very, very common. It's invasive all over the world. Um, so this ends up being something that's sort of interesting to think about and this kind of question of, of species richness. So that's, that's sort of how it's termed, is that a group is, is rich with species, as if it's somehow a good thing to have lots of species. We'll kind of examine that. Um, but so, so this question of you know, why are rodents so species rich? About 2,500 species of rodents uh, dating back to 70 million years ago. Sort of this, um, this common ancestor splitting off from, from other placentals. And so that question ends up being the same question as asking, you know, why some other lineages are so species poor? So, so why is there only one aardvark is, is sort of this other question. That, you know, this is also in order. Um, like rodentia, this uh, tubula dentata, is actually older, so it, it, it diverges 80 million years ago um, from other Afrotherians, but there's only one living species. And, and we know that there's actually a lot of fossil ancestors that go along this branch. So there's something about this particular lineage that uh, causes this uneven species richness exist in the tree of life, is, is an, kind of a, another way to phrase this. And this ends up being um, kind of one of these, what I would call a, a, an evolution, a revolutionary evolutionary question, right? So it's sort of a, it's a play on words here, and, and partially it's it's revolutionary because when we actually, uh, whenever we can actually answer it, I think it'll it'll change the way that we think about um, evolutionary biology. The other question that I think goes in the same uh, category is, you know, why is there uneven species richness in some parts of the world, right? So we know that uh, tropical environments. This is a a map that I'll blow up here um, are, are extremely rich with species, uh, not just mammals, but uh, all kinds of tropical trees, uh, insect diversity, uh, birds. Basically, any, any single lineage of organism has its peak uh, species richness in you know, the Amazon rainforest, in the Congo, and in the um, in Indo-Pacific islands. And sort of this, this long-standing question of, of why that is. And so it actually, it's quite interesting to connect these, these two sort of unresolved questions of, you know, why, is this, why does the, the tree of life look the way it does? And why are, are some habitats more speciose and diverse than others? 
So this is known as the latitudinal gradient in species diversity. And we can kind of zoom in. Um, I think it it's, ends up being quite interesting to zoom in just, just to one geographic region, in this case, the, the New World, quote unquote, the, the Americas, um, you know, North, North America, Central America, and, and South America, and the Caribbean, and to kind of um, just, just focus on these New World mammals. And sort of with this question of, okay, that's, that's the, the pattern of species richness that we see in space, but then how are they related evolutionarily? Um, we, can, we, we can sort of draw these same, oop, I better watch out how I move my hands, huh? Um, we, can, you know, we can draw these same diagrams to, to reconstruct evolutionary history, but sort of just, just focusing on this, this one geographic region. And then ultimately towards trying to figure out the processes that generated that richness. So as we're going back in time on the phylogeny, we're also going back in time to a different earth, right? So we, we know something about plate tectonics and that um, you know, 65 million years ago, South America was not connected uh, to North America. There was, this was a, an island continent. And that you know, as we kind of step forward through time, this was also the Amazon was flooded this was an inland sea. Um, lar large portions of North America were underwater as well. Uh, you see these continents coming together to look as, th as they do today. But then even, even as, most, as recently as uh, the last glacial maximum, you know, 21,000 years ago, when we had you know, glaciers extending uh, you know, down qu quite far into North America, we had like, you know, these, these miles of, of glacier um, not only in North America, but also glaciating large portions of South America. Um, you know, what, what impact do these historical events then have on the, the biodiversity patterns that we see today? And how is that written in the, the um, evolution that we can reconstruct from the present? And so this, this kind of dynamic of, you know, so evolutionary history as shaped by Earth history and these dispersal events um, ends up being quite interesting. And, you know, it's, we're, um, we're trying to reconstruct it from the present back into the past. And so I'll just kind of zoom in here and, and give you uh, another, another different perspective on, on this tree. And so because we're subset just to the new world here, um, you can kind of, you interpret this, um, the fact that we see radis, which is the, the common uh, Norway rat, and, and musk, which is the house mouse. Um, is the, the fact that that's part of the, the New World fauna today uh, is only the case because of this dispersal event when um, you know, mice and rats were brought on ships of, of sailors uh, coming from the New World, not, not only to the mainland, but also to, to many islands and have d disrupted lots of biological processes in that way. But it becomes very obvious that this is, has no close relatives, these, these two lineages in the New World. Similarly, um, humans themselves, right, like kind of disperse themselves across the world, right? So we can kind of see that, you know, we've got lots of new world monkeys here, but actually Homo sapiens is the only old world monkey that, that is, um, that's present. And so, yeah, so, so humans are old world monkeys in the, in the sense of a phylogeny. We're also apes, but apes are, are monkeys in the context of this tree. So we started to see evidence of you know, these Clovis points 14,000 years ago. Uh, now we, we're getting a lot of information from uh, ancient DNA. So we, all, we now have a, a complete genome of the Neanderthals. Um, and that's uh, in the old world in this case, but we're also getting lots of ancient DNA information from um, Native Americans in, in the new world that's helping to reconstruct this history. Kind of moving down on that same path, you see uh, another interesting dynamic where you've got New World monkeys here uh, and these, these uh, caviomorph rodents. And as it turns out, these, these were bo these, um, both of these groups have ancestors in Africa uh, around the same time period. And so what, basically what, what this ends up, um, the, what we end up inferring, and this was, this was part of my dissertation work uh, focusing on these caviomorph rodents, is that because the, the timing of these divergences is about 40 million years ago, when Africa and South America were already quite far apart, um, it couldn't have been just, a, just a, the movement of the continents that separated those lineages. It had to have been some sort of overwater dispersal event. 
um, it's referred to as a rafting event, which is pretty wild. You know, you, you think about how, how did, uh, did, were monkeys and rodents on the same raft? Like, we actually can't rule that out because the, the timing of these events, um, they have overlapping air bars. So that, this ends up uh, being quite interesting. Uh, I think blind snakes also share a similar history. And so I give those as sort of examples to get you interested in, in the, the type of information that can be learned from a phylogeny, right? So I think it, it's, it's fair to think about this as sort of a, a roadmap, right? So an evolutionary roadmap for learning about biodiversity. And so then there's this sort of this question, like it's like, okay, that, that seems cool, but, but why, why do we want to make this map? And, and why do we make any map? It's sort of a, an interesting question, right? Um, this is a map of, of how I got here today, right? So I, I came from over here in New Haven, uh, you know, on the, on the train. Uh, Theodora picked me up in, in South Norwalk, so I didn't have to do this part of myself. But I could have ridden my bike Right, that would have taken four and a half hours, but it would have been maybe pretty fun. Um, in general, like, wh why, do you, why do you guys think we make maps? Does anyone have, have any input on that? You can just shout things out, yeah. Guidance. What's that? Guidance. Guidance, okay. Sure. Guidance on what? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, right. So, so it's sort of like I'm trying to get from A to B, and then I'm going to need that map to get home too, right? Yeah. So that that's exactly it, right? So it's so from where you want to go, uh, and then find your way home, retrace your steps, or reconstruct your your evolutionary history. Um, and in, really, in, the, in this context, um, if, you're, if you're then the map maker, right? So I guess now it's like Google is, is the map maker. But Google's building off a lot of information that you know, generations of people have put together. But really, these, these map makers are enabling people, others to navigate, ultimately, um, and perhaps themselves to navigate as well. So, so I'm going to be talking about you know, how do we build these time trees of life? What, what do we actually know? Um, and it really involves the, the combination of, of fossils, morphological information, uh, and DNA to sort of to reconstruct these histories. And then specifically, I want to talk about this new mammal tree of life that we've been building um, during my postdoc at Yale. And um, kind of, you know, this, this important, interesting thing that because we're mammals, like we can actually learn about our own evolution in this context. And then, you know, get, try and get to this question, this kind of ultimate question of, you know, why are there so many rodents? Why is uneven species richness um, a thing on the tree? So, so first, you know, just thinking about trees and, and time. Um, you know, trees, these phylogenetic trees have been built for a long time, turns out. Um, this is, you know, and, the, and they actually used to be built to look as a tree, I think that you know this analogy makes a lot of sense. Where you have these branches, um, and their and their descendants, these are the leaves of the tree. And so, one of the first trees um, that's been, that was published in 1809 by Lamarck um, does a pretty interesting thing with with mammals. And so, this is all in French. And so, I have like the translations here. But yeah, he called it the table serving to demonstrate the origin of different animals. And he has, uh, you know, the duckbill platypus as sister to a parrot um, or to a bird. And so that's interesting, right, because it, it has a, a bill. I mean, he, he was thinking just kind of very literally in terms of morphology, this uh, has sort of a, a bird-like um, rostrum, basically, a, a nose. And so I'm going to call it related. Then he had these um, amphibious, amphibious mammals sort of what he's saying here, and, and he was specifically referring to like dugong and manatee, these, these big sea cows, and then cetaceans, uh, whales, uh, yeah, and then uh, ungulates, that's, that's what they're saying here, and then this, this refers to all other mammals. And so it's, it's interesting, right? So this is, a, this is an evolutionary hypothesis. He's putting out a hypothesis 
very early one, and then you know, we've subsequently been revising things. Another idea of, a, of an evolutionary tree from 1946, this is focusing on rodents and, and based on, on morphological relationships of things. Um, we were talking, this is the capybara here, we were talking about that. You know, it's, it's larger than all the other rodents. Um, I like this diagram just because it's uh, got nice drawings, but I don't know if it's necessarily, I mean, it, it's interesting historically to kind of look back on these things. Uh, here's, here's one of dinosaurs, right? So kind of going back, going towards the present, thinking about morphological relationships of dinosaurs. And you, can, and you see that there's lots of different ways to, to draw these trees. They don't all have, they can be drawn circularly, they can be drawn linearly. It, they all convey the same information. And then here's a, a more recent one. Um, this is a, uh, a phylogeny of insects. And so this is actually based on um, nearly complete genome sequences of, of different insect lineages and then calibrate it to time in millions of years. And so this is kind of getting more towards the, towards the present, more towards what um, the type of research we're doing with mammals as well. So, so thinking back to this very simplified diagram that we showed at the beginning, um, you know, we've got these branches with evolutionary relationships, common ancestors. And then a really interesting part of this is that the actual length of the branch and, the, and these inter branches um, gives you information about the rate at which the process occurred, um, at least the process that has uh, resulted in, in living descendants, you know, when you're, when you're not including extinct taxa here. And so ultimately, this is, these are the rates of speciation, which is like species birth or creation, and extinction, species death. And so we can actually think about these trees as, as not just trees of life, but trees of life and death, because that, that's ultimately what the process is, right? Um, so here in, is what's being depicted. These, these yellow dots are extinct lineages. You can think of them as extinct species. Um, and then you know, we're running this, this simulation forward in time to the present. Um, but if we're, only, you know, if we're only looking at the reconstructed lineages at the present, uh, we're missing all this extinct diversity, right? So we've got 25 living lineages in this simulation and, and 80 extinct ones. Um, and so, so these extinct lineages, some proportion of them would be preserved as fossils, right? Um, you know, you can think of this like there's, there's populations on each one of those, these extinct branches. And then some, by some random chance, some of them are preserved um, ex exquisitely like, like these ones. So these are, these are actually really amazing fossils, whole body fossils. I mean, you can tell this is a mammal already, like has this really furry, tr furry tail. This is a bat. Um, for, but from 47 million years ago in a really well-dated well um, pit in Germany. And so, but kind of, you see that, you know, this, the difference between this tree and this tree is quite different, right? But th this is just us reconstructing that trajectory from the present. And so we're missing a lot of information with all these extinct taxa. Um, when we're reconstructing things from the present. But there is, there's still information in the, the gaps between these branches and the splits. So that's ultimately what we're trying to get at. You know, we have this, this true process with all the extinct and extant lineages. And then we, you know, have just the tree with the, the things that made it to the present. And we're basically trying to sample DNA and, and morphological traits from the things that are alive at the present to reconstruct this past. Um, and as you can imagine, it's, it's pretty imperfect, right? So we, we have, um, you know, we're, we're, our sampling is imperfect, our ability to reconstruct the evolutionary process is imperfect, and so we end up with a lot of uncertainty. And so I call this, a, you know, it's a probabilistic inference. And that's why th this tree, you know, often we, we draw these trees very simply, just with like one line and one node, but Really, they're, they're a lot more fuzzy, and there's um, kind of a probability distribution at, at every branch that, um, that represents what we actually know. And so, so I said here that we never know the true tree without air. Um, we know some sort of a, a probability distribution around that tree. So ultimately, we, um, you know, we're getting this type of a situation where we have you know, DNA and relative divergences among, among things. Um, 
And then, and then we're calibrating those, those molecular divergences with, with fossils to put things into absolute time. And certainly in order to, to calibrate them with fossils, we need to have um, morphological information from the living things as well, not, not just DNA. Uh, this is sort of a simplified diagram here. And so, you know, trees are this symbolic representation of the evolutionary process. And then there's this time component. And the time component, I think, is really, um, it's really critical, but it's also really hard to understand. You know, we're talking, talking about millions of years. Like, what does a million years mean? Um, it's something that I, I like, struggle with a lot. And I, and I remember being in your guys' seat and being, like, totally baffled by it. Um, so I'm just have a little like short section about just what is this geological time thing? What does it mean? Uh, this is a cool diagram that you know kind of weaves a spiral going back to the the beginning of the universe. And it's like whoa, that's that's really massive. Um, but usually we think about time as the straight line, right? So we even you know we kind of draw it this geological time scale. Um, it's not necessarily. Uh, in, in constant intervals, right? We've got, you know, 540 million years here, going all the way to the present. I mean, human history, I couldn't even, I, I couldn't even draw a line fine enough in this time scale to, to represent, you know, the last 10,000 years of human history. Um, so to, 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 to think about that, though, helps you understand the, the, how these evolutionary processes could create such diversity, though. And so another way uh, to think about that, which I think is, is kind of interesting, is this cosmic calendar analogy. Has anyone heard of this before? Anyone? Carl, Carl Sagan lovers, anyone? Cool, well, all right, well then I'm, then I'm exposing you. So, so Carl Sagan was the, this awesome um, science educator. Uh, the Cosmos series was, was recently remade by Neil deGrasse Tyson. But they use the, this analogy, right, where each month is a billion years in, uh, the, the evolution of the universe, right? So it's like January 1 is the Big Bang. Uh, you know, the Earth forms over, over here in September. What is it, today is like September uh, 20th, right? Yeah, so like life hasn't even begun yet. Think about that, it's been since like the beginning of, uh, since, since New Year's Eve. Uh, you know, the Cambrian explosion won't happen until December 15th. And then it's sort of like, you know, humanoids are start to be developed, but then all of written human history is in the last 10 seconds on, on New Year's Eve. You think about that, right? So it's like, just, just to try and fathom, you know, how does all this diversity actually happen? Time is, is a crazy component of it, and it's important to, to try and grapple with it. So it's this, this vast and intuitive thing, but um, it's, it's seemingly required in order to understand uh, the evolutionary processes that we're talking about here. So we've got these, you know, these time trees that we're reconstructing. And then specifically, you know, thinking about mammals, right? So, you know, I started out talking about mammals. I'm going to be going into more detail now. And, and really why mammals is, is an important question to ask. Um, and I'll start with kind of my, my, my personal connection to mammals. Because um, it wasn't that long ago that I was also an undergrad um, doing field work in the Great Basin Desert. So this is, uh, you know... Nevada, kind of western U.S. I was going to school in, in Los Angeles, so we would drive out here on the weekends, kind of take like a four or five day weekend and, and trap rodents. And um, so this was some field work in 2005 with uh, my advisor, John Hafner. And, you know, believe it or not, we had digital cameras back then. And this is a, like a, a video that I took of, of uh, this is a kangaroo mouse, so microdipodops. And his, his dog was smelling it there. Uh, <laughs> his dogs were really well trained that they would they would uh, they would only sit next to the traps that had this species in them, and we would tra we would trap lots of live trap lots of different rodents, but um, we would know which ones had kangaroo mice in them by his dogs. And so th this work we were we were driving all over the Great Basin sampling these populations, uh, and then going back and doing genetic work to try and understand the uh, to reconstruct the evolutionary history. Uh, on kind of this finer scale of among populations, sort of population genetics. And sort of what we ended up finding, you know, we started out with doing this work, there are these two described species of kangaroo mice that are sister to all these kangaroo rats. So kangaroo rats are more common, there's 20 species, they're sort of all across North America. And as it turns out, we found that there, there's actually these, these six genetic units uh, throughout the Great Basin 
which are really at the species level. So it, uh, compared to kangaroo rats, they're, they're, these divergences are, are analogous. And so we're in the process of, uh, even though this, this, we did this work 10, 12 years ago, uh, you know, we're still in the process of describing these things. Um, so yeah, so science, so science can take a long time also, right? Speaking of time. Um, and so, you know, from, from that work, uh, I got interested in, in this evolutionary time component and the ability to incorporate fossils, right? So um, that particular lineage didn't have very good fossil record, but there, there's this great fossil record of rodents in South America, specifically in, in Patagonia. And so um, I went to do my PhD in Chicago and, and work on, on this lineage of rodents that, that has this awesome fossil record. So, so this is actually a capybara as well, the world's largest rodent uh, kind of rolling around. So I took this picture um, over here in, in northern Argentina. Um, they, and, and they're also social. So if you haven't um, seen videos of capybaras, I, I recommend looking, checking them out. But so, you know, so thinking about the, the fossil record, I mean, this is just one example of, of a place I went to along the coast, um, not so far from Buenos Aires. And you can see this is, this is actually a line in the rock that represents the boundary between the Pleistocene and the Pliocene. Um, so about 2.6 million years. And we, we, were, we were basically chipping away at the rock here. This is my collaborator. Uh, what you can see there is that's an entire burrow. This is an animal that was, that was fossilized inside of its burrow, um, kind of in situ and, um, and persists in, until we, we extracted the animal. And so this is, that's a, uh, Actinomies is um, an ancestor to these tucotucos that, that uh, still live in South America. They're kind of like gophers in North America. They're burrowing. They uh, eat roots and tubers. They have these really big um, incisors. They're really like, thick incisors. We also found uh, a galliptodon shell, which is awesome. It's like, if anyone, um, has anyone heard of a galliptodon? They, they're these, these giant um, related to armadillos that they all died out about a million years ago, but some of them were as big as like school buses, uh, giant. And they had these, these big um, shells to protect them. But so, so basically, I mean, my point here is that, you know, mammals are really fascinating. They're, they're sort of everywhere. And then also the fossil record is, um, really allows us to understand the timing of these divergences and try and reconstruct this, this uh, temporal history. So this is a, this is a, in a synthesis of the whole mammal fossil record from public databases. Um, and this dotted line here is when uh, dinosaurs go extinct, right? So when that, that big meteor uh, hits uh, the Yucatan Peninsula 66 million years ago, there's, a, there's also a, an impact on the, the mammal fauna, um, kind of this, this burst in speciation in blue and, and extinction in red. And so, yeah, so th this is, these are my, Recent collaborators, the, the people I've been working with the last four years while at Yale. Um, so I'm the, like the main postdoc on this project, but then there's, there's people at UC Berkeley and Florida and George Washington um, that are part of this project that's really sort of tetrapod wide. So that I've been focusing on the mammal part of it, but um, other people are focusing on birds, uh, amphibian squamates, and uh, crocodilians. So it ends up being, being quite interesting. And Sort of, this was the state of affairs when we started the project, that there was this existing uh, reconstruction of mammal-wide evolutionary history from 2007 uh, called the super tree. And th this, this is a, you know, it it's ends up being a really important paper for pushing the field forward, but the, part of the problem with it is that there are these large areas that are unresolved, um, where the information that was merged when they created this tree conflicted with each other, and so they just collapsed it rather than, than being branching. Uh, it's like one big comb here, these unresolved, unresolved nodes. And so that's, this, these are throughout the tree. So you're not sure, are these instances of really fast species diversification, or we just don't have any confidence? And it, it turns out that it's, it's really that we don't have any confidence, but people have been um, sort of assuming the opposite when they analyze these trees. And so we, um, in order to build this tree, we, we actually the first thing we had to figure out was how many species of mammals there are. So it's sort of, uh, you know, this, this sort of basic question is actually hard to pin down. So a lot of uh, work on the basic taxonomy of mammals. 
And then looking at you know, genetic divergences, these, these relative divergences that we would then calibrate to time. So incorporating the fossil data, thinking about how we can um, pull those relative divergences into absolute time. And then uh, you know, assembling all this information to reconstruct the full evolutionary history of, of mammals. So I won't go into all, all these details because a lot of it gets fairly specialized. I just want to kind of say that in general, you know, we were, we were using these public uh, DNA sequence databases, kind of this approach that um, kind of baits certain genes and, and we, we create these baits to pull identifiable genes out of the kind of universe of DNA that's, that's in these public databases and then to clean it. Um, and I'd be glad to talk to people more about this if they're interested. We end up with this, this large matrix, um, you know, 4,100 species, almost 40,000 sites, but there's a lot of gaps in the matrix as well. But this is, this is sort of the raw data that we're, that we're reconstructing evolutionary relationships with. And you know, then lots of compute time, so kind of uh, you know, parallel processing, this, just reconstructing this one tree um, on uh, parallel processing ends up taking you know, a week. Um, and then you know, we, we applied this sort of unique approach where we're taking this big tree and then dividing it into smaller problems that don't overlap with each other so that we can then um, rescale them on the backbone and, and create this, this one large tree. So this is an approach that, that we're calling backbone and patch that sort of contrasts with the super tree approach of previous studies. The important thing here um, is that we're, by doing this, rather than collapsing, disagreeing information into these, these big combs, we're able to keep all that uncertainty. And so, so this is what that ends up looking like. Um, we have these, these samples of trees rather than one tree. There's, there's 10,000 trees that sort of averages over all the uncertainty in that reconstruction. So you see this sort of jiggling back and forth both in time. So this is time on the, on the x-axis here. And then the, the species relationships are also changing, particularly among these big, these big nodes. Um, so the relationship with Afrotheria, which you know, includes elephants, and Xenarthra, which includes uh, armadillos and sloths. Is, is, that's an unsolved question in mammal evolutionary history. And so we actually don't need to say it's one or the other. Our, our trees include both. So this ends up being really, really interesting because uh, what we end up then being able to do is exclude alternative hypotheses even with all that uncertainty. And then we can we'll be pretty confident that we, that we still know something. So it's, so it's not that we... Um, you know, can't know anything because of this uncertain evolutionary process. It's that we just have to be honest about the uncertainty that we do have. So this is what, what the, that topology ends up looking like. Um, you know, this black line here is our consensus, this, but this, this red line, these red lines has all that uncertainty in it. And that's compared to these, these two previous super trees that don't really have any uncertainty in them, even though there is a lot of uncertainty in the data. And so um, if you're interested in any of this, you can actually just give it a list of species and you'll be able to subset from our tree and, and get uh, samples of, of trees as well. And you can also do this for, for birds and sharks and squamates. This is all on the vertlife.org website as part of our grant. And so, yeah, so with the time I have left, I wanna just um, kind of pull back and then think about, you know, think about what we then able to learn from this, this tree, right? So we started thinking about all the species diversity in mammals, you know, 6,400 species. And then, you know, now we can place all that diversity in, into this rigorous temporal framework with, um, you know, with this new tree of life that we've constructed. And so I think the, the, the most fun aspect of this is to be able to zoom in to primates um, I mean, it's sort of selfish, right? Like, so w because we're mammals, we want to want to see like where are we? Like, we're in this tree. That's pretty cool. So I'm going to zoom in, keep zooming in uh, to mammals here. So right, like as I said at the beginning, we're old world monkeys, um, old world monkeys and apes here. Keep zooming in. Um, we're at, yeah, there's 27 species of hominoidea, so lesser apes, the gibbons, and then things like chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. 
Um, yeah, and then the family hominid day, just the great apes. And then we, you know, finally we get to uh, Homo and Pan, right? So humans and uh, chimpanzees and bonobos over here. And the really interesting, cool thing about this is we were able to, because there's this, these ancient DNA efforts, so we have Neanderthals are in the tree, Heidelbergensis, and Homo Denisova is in the tree also. And if, if you guys know anything about um, this paleoanthropology, the, the Denisovan is only known from a finger bone that was found in a cave in Central Asia, and then we were, we were able to get the whole genome out of it um, and find that it was actually a hybrid. So this is like a reconstruction of this hybrid uh, Denisovan individual that they think had red hair because it had the, the gene for red hair. Um, so it's, it's really a pretty, pretty exciting time, and I, I would say like placing this kind of human genetics component within the broader sphere of all mammal evolution Right, so like you zoom back out and then, then here it is, there's the full thing. Um, and so, so towards this question, right, so how, how, many, how, many, well, how many rodents are there? Does anyone remember how many rodents there are? Checking your notes. <laughs> yeah? Is there a point about species? Nice, yeah, cool. Yeah, and we don't know how many individuals there are. That would be another question. It'd be like millions of individuals. Um, so then the question of, you know, why are there so many rodents, right? Um, ultimately, in order to get differential diversity, you have to have differential diversification, right? So this speciation minus extinction component. So there's, there's been uneven net diversification in rodents as well in, or, in order to get this. Uh, and as we mentioned at the beginning, you know, this latitudinal diversity gradient as well. Like, so there's, there's the spatial component to this process. And so there's, there's sort of um, three main hypotheses uh, that I'll just go and do really briefly. There's sort of this, this adaptation story of like, okay, there's so many rodents because they're really good at what they do, right? They have this, these double uh, incisors that continue to grow throughout their life. It's this awesome tool. It self-sharpens. And so they've just been able, they're in every environment. They're really, they have all this ecological opportunity, so they're better at speciating, I guess. That, that's, that's one hypothesis. Uh, another hypothesis is that the, the clade is older. It's older than the other species. Uh, or, or, and so then there's been more time for it to diversify and, and collect um, species. And this is sort of saying that, that speciation has been constant, but there's just been more time. We sort of already know that that's, that's not totally the case when you think of a, a lineage like ard, aardvark. You know, it's as old or older than rodents, but there's only one species. And then there's this, this other story that I'll, I'll kind of talk about just a little more. Um, this gene flow story that, that some, some traits uh, let uh, the population sort of split apart more than others, right? So, so if you don't move around very much, then it's easier to become isolated, and then maybe then uh, you become genetically isolated as well as geographically isolated and speciate in, in that context. So, so that, that's sort of the framework that we end up looking at on, on the full tree. And so this is another way of plotting it, sort of linearly rather than circularly. And these colors that I've been showing on the tree are indicative of um, these tip speciation rates, which are the, the rates at the instantaneous present. Um, and so the redder colors are faster rates and the bluer colors are these longer branches that are slower rates. And then these circles are these rate shifts. So the biggest rate shift that we, that we uncover is in a, um, the South American rodent, sort of really unexpectedly actually. This South American rodent called the Tucotucos, Tonomis, has a, is, is right here, this, this big rate shift um, about six million years ago, apparently uh, something was going on in this rodent. And so this is a subterranean burrower. So you start to think about this idea of, of space use uh, and dispersal ability. And certainly they don't, it's, if you're underground, you don't have to go very far underground in order to not be able to find uh, any of your friends, right? So the, this sort of idea that because it has low vigility, um, which, is, which is another word for dispersal ability, uh, vigility, um, that perhaps that's why it's been speciating a lot. And so we ended up looking at this, this trait kind of mapped along the tree, and you see this, this these very uh, high vigility values here in things like whales, 
and um, cows and their relatives and in carnivores that are often preying upon the, the, those ungulates. Um, but then lots of kind of low vigility species in rodents and in, and in bats actually. So even though bats can fly, they often don't fly very far. Um, and perhaps when they do fly very far, they get isolated there. So that's, that ends up being kind of an interesting dynamic. We also end up looking at um, daytime activity so versus nocturnal. Um, and that ends up actually having quite a large effect on things. You see only certain clades, things like primates, um, become diurnal, but it's sort of rare. There's some diurnal rodents and some, uh, some in uh, Artiodactyla. And then this latitudinal range. And so similarly, you know, this vigility dynamic in the artiodactyls translates into these, these giant latitudinal ranges, but then lots of rodent species have these really tiny little bands. Um, and so part of the, the, uh, the nice thing about this is just getting all this information in the same context. Um, having these traits allied with good rate information hasn't been possible in mammals until now. So, so we don't really know what we're going to find. Um, we're, we're only starting to find it. One, the one piece of information that I, that I will share is that it does appear that vigility um, is having an effect on, on recent speciation rates. So you can't quite tell from the scatter plot because the, the data is really messy. But these, um, these are significant effects in the inverse. So the, the low vigility species are having uh, faster rates of speciation. So it's sort of what you'd expect in the context of if you can't move very far, the rare event when you do move far, you get isolated from the population. And then uh, it, as long as you persist long enough, you'll become a, your own species. But I think a lot of these isolates go extinct before they can speciate. So it's sort of this, this, this case of turnover that ends up happening. And so, so sort of you know, the, what I just explained, um, you know, visualized on the tree, looks something like this, right? So you've got this, this sort of turnover situation where you've got you know, lots of things splitting off, but then going extinct, splitting off, going extinct. And what we're just seeing at the very present is the situation of a lot of diversity, um, but it's just the product of, of high speciation and high extinction versus there's this other type of diversification where maybe you're speciating very fast without very much extinction, or perhaps both, both are just low. Um, so we end up sort of thinking about the diversification in this context of turnover versus persistence. And, and I think that this is sort of this gene flow story is more in the turnover mode. And perhaps you know, some of these adaptations, things like diurnality, the, the taking advantage of these daytime niches, um, end up you know, changing the extinction rates in mammals. But that's, but that's sort of an unresolved question. And we're, still, we're just sort of starting to dig into it. Um, so just to conclude, I just want to you know, um, say that you know, I, I think we, we've improved some of the, the honesty of the rate estimates throughout the mammal tree as, as part of this work. Um, and really the variation in, in the timing and in the, uh, and in the relationships. And then there's this sort of role of, of geographic isolation that's starting to come to the forefront um, in, in regard to the latitudinal diversity gradient as well. And um, with that, I'll, I'll just say that we, we also made some t-shirts. Um, I, I started silk screening over the winter with this design. Um, so if anyone's like dying to get one of these t-shirts, uh, let me know and I can, I can ship one to you or something like that. Um, but I, I'll take some questions. Thank you.